This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. Welcome to the Craft Beer Brewing Podcast. I'm your host, co-founder and editorial director of Craft Beer Brewing Magazine, Jamie Bogner. We are here for podcast episode 196 on the central coast of California, Buellton, to be exact. And sitting across from me at the brewery because we're doing this in person again, and I love it. Yes, it's uh, Kevin Ashford, brewmaster for Figaro Mountain Brewing. Welcome to the podcast, Kevin. Wow, thank you so much, Jamie. Uh, it's it's great having you here in person. Uh, there's nothing like sharing a beer together. So thank uh, you so much. I'm excited. Uh, you know, we've uh, enjoyed Figaro Mountain beers for years, and uh, you all have sent them to the magazine uh, over over the last number of years. Uh, you know, in that same kind of past decade, you seem to have won something like 25 GABF medals. And so I, someone might say that you're doing something right down here. Yeah. We, you know, we're, we're really proud of, of the success we've had on, on the competition level. And, uh, ultimately I, I got to chalk that up to a great team that that's really committed to the quality of our beers. And, and, uh, and, and that's all I can say. I'm, I'm really proud of them. It's a highly competitive brewing scene out here in in the central coast of California with folks that uh, are performing at a high level. Um, And I think we all know who who that broader spectrum of breweries are. (laughs) It's really awesome to be out here. And it's great to be on the road again, talking to people and drinking beer in place and people in places where that beer is made. And so, yeah, I can't wait to talk. We're going to talk about uh, uh, lager brewing obviously, because that's a big part of what Figaro Figaro Mountain does. Everything from fresh hops and lager beer to single hop pilsners and uh, light lager, maybe even. Going to kind of run that spectrum because you all do interesting things with kind of traditional styles of beer. That's right. Uh, Yeah. So I think we're, we're mostly the classic styles people, you know, we we really love to to look at how beer has been made over the course of history and, and kind of take the new spin on it, um, looking at, you know, how we're evaluating our ingredients, uh, new methodology. Um, we're, we're just really happy to look back and, and harken back to some of those classic styles, but kind of turn it on itself and, and, and give it a new look. Well, I can't wait to dig in before we do that. Like your flagship beer, you can rely on G and D chillers for the same quality and consistency. G and D guarantees that every chiller they build will hit 28 degrees without breaking a sweat they never stop. They draft, they craft, they service each and every brewery, big or small, all in an effort to build one hell of a chiller. For nearly 30 years, G&D has been committed to cold. Reach out for a quote today at gdchillers.com. Also, even the best yeast deserves a helping hand with seltzer fermentation, which is why Pathfinder N Pure Seltzer Nutrient ensures reliable and complete fermentation of a seltzer base while providing a clean, neutral fermentation profile. Not to mention it provides all the essential nutrients required by yeast for production of hard seltzer bases fermented from those sweet, refined sugars. Give your seltzer yeast a boost by visiting bsgcraftbrewing.com and searching for Pathfinder N-Pure Seltzer Nutrient or call BSG at 1-800-374-2700. Three, nine. So Kevin, we normally start the podcast off with uh, a little bit about your history. Walk us through uh, uh, how you got into to brewing and the path that led you here it's, to brewmaster of Figaro Mountain. Yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's always awesome hearing from brewers about, you know, their, their whole path uh, to their current, current uh, existence. But I started uh, where, where most brewers that I know, they either started in home brewing or they started on a packaging line or something. I think it's a double-edged sword. I, I actually was hired as a brewer after being a bartender. So I was a bartender for years throughout college. I went to school at James Madison University in Virginia. Um, I started bartending there. Uh, from there, I worked at a bar uh, in town that that had 100 beers. And at the end of every night, I was, I was allowed to grab a beer. And they were beers from all over the place, but a lot of craft beers. This is back in 2009. And um, I really I found out that... that there was a lot more than just the the average stuff that you would see on the shelf standard. And um, I knew right then and there that, that I had an interest and in that um, I, I knew I needed to, to taste them all, you know, so to speak. So once I graduated, it was uh, 2009 and I was moving back to my home in Maryland. And I just remember 
you know, it was, it was really tough. 2008, uh, that whole era, it was really hard to find sure, a job sure. at all. And, um, you know, I, I studied politics in college and, and I was offered a job with the state department and I, I looked at it around and, and I, I thought about what my days were going to be like working in Washington, DC. And, and, uh, I, I thought I, I really wanted to go another direction. So, I remember my dad just looking at me like, what the hell are you doing here? You've got this job lined up with the government right out of, right out of college. And it's, it's going to, it's going to be really hard to find a job right now. So I, I rested on my laurels and I, I went back into bartending, um, at this great craft beer bar in uh, downtown Ellicott city. It's just outside of Baltimore, Maryland. And, um, Right from there, I, I I fell in love. We had rotating seventeen taps, and I was buying beer. I was I was selecting what was going on draft. I was only uh, twenty two years old at the time, <laughs> so it was like wow. I was a kid in a candy store, and I I really got to explore and see a lot of what the Mid Atlantic had to offer and beyond. And uh, one day, I met a brewer um, who was one of my regulars, and he worked at Heavy Seas uh, Clipper City Brewing Company. Uh, they were, uh, I think at the time we were the second largest brewery, uh, in Balt in Maryland. Um, flying dog at the time was bigger, but he, uh, I asked him one day if he had a floor sweeping job. I think that's kind of the, the standard in is like, well, I'll, I'll scrub floors. I'll do whatever. And he said, let me get you a, an interview with the brewmaster. And I remember going in for the interview and I remember him just looking at me and saying, well, you're the first interview and, uh, you're, you don't seem like a piece of shit. So <laughs> I think I'm, I think I'm going to bring you in and, uh, we're going to get you right to work. So I started brewing at, at uh, heavy seas and, um, something I, 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 it's not a regret, but I do look back and wish I had a lot more packaging experience because now all the things that I, that I have to do with packaging, um, I have a great team of, of, of packaging team and, um, I, I can only weigh in so much on a lot of the packaging stuff because we have some specialists. So I started brewing and uh, I ended up brewing there for about four years and uh, I became lead brewer. And uh, that was about the time where uh, my boss, uh, Ernesto Egoat, um, he was in the Bitburger school uh, in Germany and uh, he ran San Miguel pubs and breweries in the Philippines and all over the world. And uh, he was a great lager brewer. And that's where it all started for me was loving lager beer was through my boss, Ernesto. And once he left, I felt like it was, it was time for me to move on personally and grow. And, um, so, so you I, traded coasts, I traded coasts. Uh, I think there was, there was always something in me where, where the West was calling and, and I felt that I needed to answer that call. And I, uh, I ended up looking on pro brewer, you know, and looking for jobs and, and, you know, if, if there's somebody out there right now, I would, I would encourage you to just start looking cause there's tons of opportunities to, to <laughs> yeah. get your foot in the door. Sure. Sure. And, um, so I, you know, I, I ended up, they're, uh, they're hiring a lot of floor sweepers. They, right yeah, now. yeah. Floor sweeping should be number one on your, on your list of skills, I think. But, um, so I was good at sweeping floors, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, I'd worked for four years and I, and I was looking for going out on a kind of on an, another place and, and, I, I, I was thinking West. So I was looking at jobs in Colorado and certainly looking for jobs in California at the time. Um, I mean, great beer was being made everywhere, but I, in my head, that's where all the breweries were and, and that's where I needed to head out. So I applied for a, a, a brewery in Boulder and uh, I applied for, uh, this, this company Figueroa mountain in what I once thought was called Buelton, California. <laughs> and I still tell that story because yeah. people in town hate me for it. They think it's so bad. It's named after like a a, a family in the, in the area that's, that's pretty notorious. So they were like, how could you, how could you blow that? But uh, long story short, I ended up uh, taking the job with Fig Mountain and uh, I was hired on as a, as uh, the lead brewer. And this was, this was back in uh, February or January of 2013. And um, I became head brewer in 2015 and I just uh, kept moving forward. And, and we grew from at the time in 2013, we were about 3000 barrels uh, to, uh, 2019, we were 20,000 barrels. Uh, 2020 was, was a tough year for us all, but we're coming right back and, and we're producing about, we're on pace for 25,000 barrels this year. Damn. Uh, yeah. I had no idea that we were talking about that kind of scale, Yeah, but it seems like breweries are constantly surprising me these days. Uh, I've talked to Adam from Maplewood. It's like, they're 16,000 barrels. Like, how did you get that big? It's, um, that, that, but that's fantastic. It's, it's pretty wild. I mean, it, it, none of us thought that. And even when I was at heavy seas, um, when I started, I think we were about 16,000 barrels at the time and in 2009. And, and by the end of that, we were, we were actually at 50,000. So, yeah. I mean, I saw a significant growth. I think that's a big reason of why fig brought me on was because they were like, look, this guy, 
just dealt with a lot you of know stuff. Scale. Yeah, sure, and, and sure. I figured I figured that part out, and it's it's really more just you know you know dealing with dealing with some stuff, and and you know going home and getting ready for the next day, and um, yeah, I'm really happy where I ended up. Well, it's kind of fun, and I, what I love about uh, Figaro Mountain is uh, that despite this kind of focus on trendiness in beer, we tend to think that trendiness drives beer sales and you can, you know, but it's awesome to talk to brewers that have grown without focusing on that trendiness that have still found avenues for growth. And even around here, I mean, you can look at someone like Firestone Walker and they've added 50% 50% uh, to their production over the last few years with a golden or a blonde ale. Absolutely. You know, it is not a hazy IPA that is driving the growth of those kinds of things. And I, so I love that these are, you know, we are positing a different avenue for growth and that not everything is predicated on being on top of the hottest, latest trends. You can build great businesses by making beautiful renditions of classic styles of beer and making them relevant to your local consumers. Yeah. I think you, you hit the nail on the head. I, you know, I, I my wife, I'm, she knows I'm guilty of this, but every time I go into, uh, you know, we, we can sell beer in, in, uh, in the grocery stores here. So I'll, I'll always venture off into the beer aisle. And, and, and if you're out there and watching me do this, please stop me in the aisle, but I'm always watching what people are picking up. And I think it's, it's fascinating to see the choices that people make. And yeah, of course, there's always going to be this, uh, inkling to grab whatever the trendiest, hottest item is, but the trendiest, hottest item only lasts as, as long as it does. And, and then we're off, you know, looking for the next one. So I think there, there is something to be said about, um, the classic styles and the things that, that all brought us to beer in the first place. And, and I think they'll always have a home, you know, maybe, maybe they fall off slightly, but, but life is cyclical. And I think we're, we're always looking at what's coming around the corner. And don't get me wrong. I love trendy styles yeah. and I, you know, I, we I, do too. I can absolutely, uh, you know, crush beautifully made hazy IPAs sure. and, uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, dessert focused stouts, everything else. Um, you know, it's not to say that those aren't wrong, but they tend to grab a lot of mind share. And I think that we don't always pay attention, but I, what I love about our magazine and the podcast is that we can talk about lager because our audience is brewers and they love talking about lager. And so let's talk about some lager. But before we do that, the most common complaint about hard seltzers, they need more flavor. Extract alone is a weak flavoring agent and can leave a chemical aftertaste, but there's a better way. The craft concentrate blends from Old Orchard are packed with real fruit first, no added sugars, and just enough natural flavor. Breweries are turning to Old Orchard concentrates for seltzer with more body, color, and aroma. Turn seltzer skeptics into supporters with seltzer that drinks like a beer. Get started at www.oldorchard.com slash brewer. Also, with nearly 20 years of innovation and experience, Brewmation specializes in electric, steam, and direct fire. Brew houses complete seller solutions and automated controls for the craft brewing industry. From a half barrel to 30 barrel systems, Brewmation puts you in control to design a brewery that fits your needs and brewing style. Whether you're starting a new brewery, upgrading your cellar, or just need some parts to keep you up and running, Brewmation has you covered. Visit them at brewmation.com to get started. So Kevin, let's talk about lagers. Awesome. Um, this is a big part of your portfolio now, and uh, and you take a few different approaches, and you've, of course, won some, some medals for your lagers too. Um, talk to me a little bit about the lagers that you brew and uh, this kind of general approach that you take to them. Sure, absolutely. And we're drinking some right now, yeah. so of course it's top of mind. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll start on the light spectrum. Um, yeah, right now we're enjoying our Agua Santa. That's our, our Mexican lager. Um, honestly, to me, it drinks a little more like a Hellas. Um, so sure, sure. The goal here, I mean, I agree it's, with you on that. Yeah, it's a it's a uh, it's a single decocted, um, really really nice light Hellas beer. Um, it has some. Uh, decoction huh? decoction i know that's 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 scary for for mexican lager but um I, when when i look at some of the great beers it's it's extremely dry this beer finishes at about one play-doh um it's 4.8 percent really dry it's got some sweetness but i wouldn't call it overwhelming it does dry out a fair amount but um I, this this one I, I just love and we've been making this beer for about five years and finally our, our, our customers have finally said, where is it? Put it in cans right now. We need it. It's hot here. What are you doing? You guys are blowing it. So we, so we ended up finally putting it in cans and, uh, 
all, all, all the staff and, and, and all of our, uh, all of our, our uh, fans are, are super stoked on that. But. That becomes their beer. Well, talk to me about how you build character in such a very, very light pale lager. Sure. So I think that when, when you talk about pale beers, I think you really have to, you know, you can, you can get as high quality ingredients as possible. So we use uh wireman, um, which I know is, is almost at this point, just it, everyone does. Right. But, but we're using, well, if you can get it, if you, well, yeah, I guess you made a good point. It's, it's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun making tracking down and, and getting everything we need, but the wirements are that awesome. Is no dig at them. No, you know, not at, at all. all. They're, they're, like, they're we incredible. We're all dealing with a global oh, yeah. shipping uh, yeah. crisis of Absol- sorts. Absolutely. Yeah. Not a dig at all. <laughs> they're, they're incredible at what they do and, and incredible, uh, getting us what we need. Um, but we're, uh, we're big fans. So this is wireman extra premium pills. Um, it's, there's a small amount of Vienna wireman as well. And then we, we do use, uh, some flaked maize in there as well, just to kind of give it that, that, uh, that, that character that we're not, you know, it's, I always laugh cause we're, we're boiling this, uh, pretty vigorously and, and, and we're removing a lot of DMS, but I, this, this does offer this kind of nice clean corn character. That's not as, uh, canned corn almost not it's like it's like that fresh kind of flavor and uh very very easy to drink so we're we're stoked on that but when you when you start with and like, just like pre-pro lager i mean it's oh yeah. hard to get a beer just that bright and sparkly with uh without just a little bit of corn it's in got it. it needs something to, to bring that color up so when when you're talking about using great ingredients with with uh, really simple beers or, or simple styles um you you almost have to bring it out in methodology and you have to you have to do something different to kind of have it stand out and and uh you know make it memorable so the decoction is what what we've chosen here um we do it with several of our loggers um we've even experimented with some ipas and stuff with decoction mashing um which decoct your ipas yeah and i i I think there there's something to be said about that Uh it's it's not with all of our core brands or anything but we we've done it with uh we've done it with a couple in the past and and we're having fun we might, we might wait, even wait continue until going I that tell way. Joe Stang, our managing editor, about that because uh, <laughs> he's the decoction fanatic. Oh, but great. If I, when we start talking about decocting IPAs, well, you know, we're, then then we're we're off the deep end somewhere. Oh man, yeah, you're so, gonna be his new best friend. Oh, that that makes me happy. Then, so I think um, when back to you know just being so simple, I think those those little changes, you know, just adding one one decoction or something like that can really add some depth. Um, it's probably a word that gets used too much, but the reason it gets used so much is because we just can't put a finger on it. You know, you just yeah. can't describe it well enough. So some people will say, Hey, th- I mean, this, this drinks like it's 100% malt. I mean, is there corn in here? And yeah, it's about 12% corn. I mean, it, it, it's not drinking like it because I think we found a way to, uh, balance the hot profile, uh, which is, uh, it's a sink, it's a, uh, Contessa, which is just this really, really cool kind of new uh european hybrid hop um that we found is really delicate it's floral uh it has the essence of grass it has all the things we're looking for uh but it's that kind of intangible it's kind of that yeah that what is that is that noble is that american is that european um which kind of offers that kind of that new age that new wave flavor that we were looking for in a beer like this that's not just oh yeah it's a zero finishing play-doh and tastes like corn and you throw a lime in it and, and you're done um that's that that was kind of the whole approach on this beer was to let's let's use some ingredients that are slightly different than what the standard would be and then let's let's decoct let's do something different to kind of embellish and 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 show off uh some of these cool ingredients i think that decoction also potentially helps it not drink like a one plato beer you know that yes. uh, and it's not that it's sweet it just produces mm-hmm. this kind of slightly bigger mouth feel this yeah, we slightly it, bigger impression of we call uh, it the weight yeah, it gives yeah. It, it gives it that weight and and that um it really does drink more like a Hellas, which which we love about it. I think uh when you look at some of the more historical uh you know kind of, kind of beers that were coming out of Mexico at the time, I mean these these were descended from German beers. So I mean right. a lot of them, especially the the more amber um styles, they they really carry on uh that 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 weight that that intangible um bavarian almost uh, kind of experience so we we wanted to carry that out as well and um i, th- I think we're pretty happy with it sure sure no it's a, it's a delicious beer and i'm halfway through the glass that we've had for five minutes now so uh, <laughs> that tells you something I, I can't stop drinking it that's right welcome welcome to the central coast it's a little warm here I mean, we might as well drink a pale lager. Um, <laughs> talk to me about, uh, um, you know, the kind of fermentation approach to this. I mean, mm-hmm. clearly, you know, since you're lager brewing, you're, you're 
working, I assume, with a kind of unified lager fermentation approach across the, the lager range just, you know, for production efficiency and everything else. Sure. What does that look like in terms of yeast choice and then fermentation methodology? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, we approach all of our lagers differently. And I think um, every brewer is Oh, wait. Of, so you just told me you don't do it that yeah, way. You do so, it all differently. Yeah, I they, like it. They I like actually, it. yeah. So I, I think um, we want them to stand out. You know, we want them to be some, some are using Augustiner. Uh, which is like my, our workhorse yeast that we're so, so into. Um, you can do a lot of stuff with it. I know brewers that the, the coolest thing about Augustiner yeast to me is that I talk to brewers all the time that use it. Everybody uses it differently. People say, oh yeah, I love Augustiner Pilsner. Oh, I love Hellas. Oh, I love Edelstoff. Oh, I love this. They, they go in and out of, of all these different things, but we all like different things about it. And I think um, we, we use Augustiner and Agua, um, which we use in red or Danish red as well. Um, which has, uh, it, it, they, I think they accentuate different characteristics. We ferment agua a little hotter. Um, so I think it gives a little bit of a interesting a ester profile. Uh, two degrees, but I think, <laughs> but I think it's so much hotter. Yeah. But I think it's noticeable, yeah. uh, when we're doing yeah. sensory, um, I, I think it does come off and, and part of that may just be because the, uh, the grain bill is just, is so simple. Uh, Danish red is double decocted as well. And, and, and there's a little more going on as far as the grist bill and, um, the, the cooler temperature, it's a higher Play-Doh. Um, the conditioning times are similar. Agua Santa is about a 45 day beer. Um, I think it rounds out the whole pr profile of it. Um, but yeah, as far as other yeasts, we we've actually, we've floated Mexican lager yeast before and we, we haven't used it in our own Mexican lager. <laughs> we've used it elsewhere. We've used it in our light beer in the past. We've used it in a uh, kind of new age pilsners. Um, we've even used Mexican lager in stuff like Baltic Porter and stuff before. Um, we've used, uh, 3470. I mean, that's really popular out there. We've played around with some Czech yeasts. Um, I think lager is just this, I know it's, it's getting trendier and trendier now. And, you know, 20 years from now, we'll be talking about what happened to lagers. They don't exist anymore. <laughs> and, and I don't know, but, um, all, all you have to do is, I mean, we'll all be using uh, GMO quake yeast at that yeah, point. Yeah, what, what's next? You know, maybe it's it's just colder now. I guess is is where we're headed. But um, you can ask any brewer, and I mean, uh, there are so many yeast banks now. And you know, I was ordering yeast today, and I, I was talking to a, one of our vendors, and and I was looking through just all the lager yeasts they have, and and I counted them up, and there were like fourteen different lager yeasts, and I was like man, you know, I've, I've only used about, you know, 10 of these and I, and over the course of a, I've been in brewing beer for 12 years now. So I'm almost one a year that I've, that I've experimented with. So I found the ones I've liked, but I know there's so much more to explore. So it's, it's only the beginning for us. Talk to me about how you handle it. You mentioned that you, um, you know, use some different temperatures depending on what the beer is. Uh, you're clearly brewing in cylinder conicals out there. And so, you know, that also mm -hmm. in terms of tank geometry produces mm -hmm. some interesting, uh, uh, you know, you, you've got to adapt, you know, to that kind of, uh, environment. Uh, talk to me about your process around that. Sure. Yeah. So we have several different vessel types, um, all cylinder conical, but we do have bright tanks. So kind of my philosophy, um, especially in particular with, with Agua and, and Danish red, um, we're brewing. We have a, we have a very short, uh, uh, fermentation for the most part, the fermentation, uh, f this beer is only about 10.4, 10.5 Play-Doh. And, um, it'll, we'll, we'll run through our primary fermentation in about four days, typically, uh, three or four days. Um, Danish red will go through in about five days typically. And then it's an extended conditioning period. So where we'd love to have some horizontal tanks, uh, we, you've kind of looked at the industrial area around, around us We're we're in several outbuildings right now. And, and uh, finding a place to put several horizontal tanks is, is kind of challenging. So you, you start to play around. And, in an and earthquake-prone environment. It's not like you can just, right. you know, you just start stacking, digging or stacking. Just keep yeah. stacking tanks on top of each other. So um, I actually had these tanks uh, fashioned, the tanks that uh, are newest 240s. They're, they're, they're pretty tall. And my thought behind that was that um, during the conditioning period, uh, we would actually get a lot more clarity. Um, out of the out of the beers and uh, so far it's worked our our filtrations have seen an uptick in um, yields uh, the the filtration days are a bit easier for those brands um, we are lagering typically uh, anywhere from uh, 33 to 45 days um, after primary so it's 
it's giving them a long conditioning time. Um, I think the, the orientation and, and the design of the tanks, they're tall, but they're narrow. Um, they cool very, uh, efficiently. Um, so I like that about them. Of course, we'd love to have some, uh, some horizontals. I think that'd be fun. It's, it's, it's great to lay something down on its side and forget about it for a long time. Um, but we just do it upright. <laughs> hey, you know, no shame in that game. That's the, the Chuck and Ed ABGB approach. I was going to say hey, it works okay for them. I was just going to drop ABGB on that. Cause, um, it's, yeah, it's a similar philosophy where it's, you know what? Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be on its side, but it does need to be cold and it does need to be stored, uh, for a while. And I think you, uh, most brewers will tell you that, you know, you taste that beer on day 20 and you taste that, that beer on day 45, there, there's a very big difference. And, uh, again, back to some of that intangible stuff where it's, I can't tell you exactly what's happening. Um, because we just, our lab is, we have a sophisticated lab, but it's, it's nowhere near as sophisticated as, as we would need it to be to uh, gather some of those data points. Sure. Sure. Uh, let's talk about Danish lager for a little bit. You know, obviously they, uh, they share some commonalities, but, uh, now you're talking about a, a kind of a reddish lager that's double decocted and uh, certainly has a more of a malt component to it. Definitely a, a touch sweeter and, uh, you know, but still very crisp and clean. Talk to me about the design of that beer. Yeah. Danish it's Danish has been a really fun beer, um, to work on since, since I first started at fig. Um, it existed before I, before I came on. And, um, at that time we were, we were brewing it as a single infusion mash. Um, and I, I just remember it finishing high and I remember not liking it. So we immediately, uh, this was, this would have been about 2014. We, we changed the mash temps, started, uh, you know, attenuating it a bit further. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm, I'm glued to, uh, the classic style approach where you have to read every parameter of every beer and, and try to nail it and get exactly in the middle of, of every spec possible. And, um, but with Danish, I just felt there was something that wasn't quite a hundred percent on. Um, it had won some medals already. So, you know, I, my boss is like, what, what the hell, are, what the <laughs> what hell are you doing? Don't screw the yeah, beer up. Yeah, exactly. It's perfect already. What's happening. But, um, we were hearing customers, you know, and, and customers override medals for me. We were hearing customers complaining about the sweetness of it. And, so, and I agreed. So, you know, what, what we did was we, we reduced that, uh, that initial mash temp. Um, we allowed it, uh, to, we extended the mash rest. Um, we did some things, changed up the water profile a little bit just to help dry it out a hair. Um, water in California is brutal. So, uh, most, most people I know are, are, are starting with RO and kind of building their own profiles. So we went, uh, more off like a, uh, uh, for that it was, it was, a, it was, a pretty close to a, a Bavarian type. So the, the water is, is pretty clean. I mean, there's, there's not a whole lot going on, but, then we, you know, we got this awesome brew house that can do a lot of things. So, uh, my thought was, well, let's modernize it. Let's turn it into the Vienna that it is. And about four years ago, that's what we did. So we, uh, we engaged a step mash, um, and we, uh, we absolutely added, uh, decoction steps and we were able to really, I think in, in my opinion, uh, make this beer the best it could possibly be. Uh, once that happened, we, that's when it started getting some no notoriety for, uh, uh, that was the, it was a BJCP, uh, guideline. It was literally referred okay. to as a definition of style. So once that happened, we knew, okay, um, maybe we're onto the right track and we, we kept rolling with it and, and it's where we are now. I think it's, it's got some nice sweetness, but it dries out enough. Um, it used to, it finished previously around, um, I want to say something like crazy, like 4.2 Play-Doh or something very high. Yeah. Very high, even for a Vienna. I mean, You're that's still on hazy the, IPA territory serious, there. Yeah, like scary hazy, where it's like, shit, did this ferment out or not? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. um, and uh, you know, learning you need new yeast, you know. But um, so that that was when we when we started bringing that down. Now it finishes closer to three, which I think is a lot more appropriate for the style. Um, it allows some of the uh, more kind of nutty and toasty notes to pop out. Uh, some of the gentle caramel notes that are there, melanoid and kind of flavor and aroma that kind of is there, but it's, it's not overwhelming. I think it, it sits nice. Um, and it might be back for another sip. So I think that that's what it's always all about. I see this continuing theme here where you are replacing sweetness with a bit of malt complexity and, and heft and weight as you might call it. Yeah. Um, to continue to deliver the appearance of that or the idea of that without the actual thing, which is, uh, it's a nice subtle psychological trick that you seem to be playing. 
I, I think that's uh, it's it's an interesting way to characterize it. I think that uh, when you look at at beer, it's it's our first thought is always okay. What can I throw at this? What what can I do more uh, versus what can I pull out? It's always thinking, okay, I know I can add uh, chocolate malt or I can add uh, you know a caramunic or something. I can I can always add more, but we we it's rare that um, that that I think it took me a long time to get there as a professional brewer to say, well, what if I pull this out, then what happens? And then we started to pull things out of, of a lot of stuff. I mean, new recipes suddenly, you know, I was always taught when I first started brewing of a three, two, one rule, you know, it's three malts, two hops, one yeast. And I live by that a lot um, where I think it's easy to say, you know what, we're going to throw seven, seven different grains in here. Hey, it's our, it's our 11th anniversary coming up. Let's throw 11 grains, 11 hops. You know, we'll do the, We'll do the whole thing. Um, you know, I think in my opinion, it, it gets a bit cacophonous. And I think we stop thinking about what each individual component does. And we start to think about how can I fix this? And uh, our approach is, okay, if there's something wrong, let's go line by line and let's let's try to figure out what we can do. Can we create that um, rich malt flavor without having to add specialty malt or without having to raise, uh, you know, the finishing gravity or I mean, there's so many things that, that you can do by pulling things out. I think it's, it's really, it's, it's kind of opened my eyes to, um, the, the beauty, the beauty and simplicity, if you will. Addition by subtraction. Absolutely. Um, talk to me about the malt component in the Danish lager. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, Danish is, is, is actually very simple. So, um, it's Vienna, Pilsner and Munich. And, uh, there's literally a splash of, uh, crystal. And then, um, we use a very, very small amount of carafa and that's it. I mean, it's five grains. That's for me, that's complex. <laughs> that's, yeah, sure, that's about sure. as complex as I ever want to get. Um, we make a lot of large barrel aged beers too. And, and I've got a, an amazing brewer, uh, James Parrish that runs our barrel program. And his thing is like, well, it's not the, the roast that I want. I need, I need this other grain. And, and we've, we found out on the other end, it's like, okay, we needed that. <laughs> you know, sometimes, sometimes it doesn't always work out, but, um, yeah, five grains, um, two hops, uh, Northern Brewer and Tetanang. And, um, I think, uh, just it's, it's the old, keep it simple, stupid. Right. And I think I, I, I live and thrive off of that. And I, and I look at how, how can we, um, keep it simple, keep it clean and, and keep it running and, and delicious. What's the, what's the secret sauce? What's the magic with Danish? It? Yeah. Time, time, time. I, th- I really do. I, I swear. I think it's a, a lot of people ask about the beers in general. And, um, when, and when you're a brewery of our size, uh, the pressure is there to increase tank velocity and, you know, turn these tanks out and, you know, make that money, so to speak. And, and I think, you, you lose something when you start rushing the beers out of the tanks. And um, it's it's a scientific um, marvel and, and very impressive in and of its own right to get a beer uh, from grain to glass or grain to bottle or, or can uh, in under 10 days. I've seen it happen, you know, and it's that's that's impressive that you're able to dial in your, your quality parameters and everything so, so well. But there's something, um, again, back to this intangible thing of beer that, that always keeps us wondering. And I think um, time. Time is time is your your friend as a lager brewer for sure. For sure, for sure. Um, let's talk about some of the uh, more uh, outre lager experiments that you're doing. I shouldn't call them experiments because they're beers that you're serving to customers, okay. and uh, you know some of those kind of elements that you're pushing there in terms of single hop, fresh hop, etc. Before we do that, there's nothing easy about brewing beer. It's an intricate, time consuming art. The last thing you need to face is a recall or a contamination that can hurt your pride and your pocketbook. Clarion Lubricants meet strict purity and performance standards to help make your system 100% food safe. That's protection for your equipment and for your beer. So make the switch to Clarion and ensure your system is running smooth and safe. Go to clarionlubricants.com to learn more. So yeah, on this, uh, you know, to continue this lager theme for a little bit, uh, you know, we were talking before we started the podcast that, uh, some of the kind of creative elements that you're pushing into in, in that lager world. And, and certainly here in California, there are other breweries pushing contemporary hopped Pilsners Highland park, of course, has made a name for themselves doing cool. That was who I was going to bring up. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, Bob and company have been doing a, a really fun job making, uh, Pilsners and, uh, you know, hoppy lagers with this kind of contemporary, you know, hop approach. 
which um, you know, there's some cool inspiration and contemporaries doing awesome stuff and uh, you're getting in that game too. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Bob and I haven't met. Um, so I'm, I'm really just a fan, um, at, at this point, but we, uh, there's an event, um, that Eagle Rock throws for, uh, it's basically LA, LA beer week and it's a battle of the brewery bands and it's super fun. And I remember being at battle of the brewery bands with the Vigoro mountain brewery band. And I was drinking this Highland park beer and I'm like, wow, this is an awesome IPA. This is, this thing's crazy. It's just blowing my brains out. And then I remember talking to somebody who's like, Oh, that Timbo pills. Yeah, no, no, it wasn't. It was actually something else. Yeah. Timbo's great. Timbo's awesome. I'm yeah. a big fan of that one, but um, no, I can't even remember what it was, but I just remember being like, wait, how and wait. So how, so I, I, yeah, I, I thought yeah. about it for days. I, I literally, I went home, I thought about it for days. Highland park's not accessible, you know, to us up here. So um, I went to their new Chinatown place a couple times, visiting some friends in LA and I, I popped by for a beer or two here and there. And, and, um, I just remember tasting these beers and being like, wow, okay, this is lager now. Like this is, this is wild. This is wild. We can get these kind of aromas, these kinds of flavors, um, borderline IPA. Like, I mean, certainly a, a, of the same mind. Sure. Uh, sure. I had that experience at a Firestone Walker invitational one year where I had a, their Nelson Sauvin hopped Pilsner and like, wait, 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 yeah. wait, that's, that's not oh, a thing. Oh, we're doing this now. Yeah. Like yeah. That, that like, was... this, this is, this is where the, the game is moving. Like sign me up that's because it. I'm all in on that. Cause they're, you know, they're, they're so familiar in, in the hop nature, but there's like a, a, a cleanliness and like a, a lack of, um, I guess it's ester profile maybe is a good, a good way to describe it. We're not, we're not getting all that like stone fruit and some of the other things that you might sure, see with sure. like some ale yeast, but you're getting this like cleanliness and, and I've, and I've uh, talked to Kevin Davey too about, you know, cold IPA and like kind of what he's doing there. And, and I think there's some symbiosis or something overlapping between these two, but um, I, I just, there's a, there's a cleanliness to it. And I, and I hate to say that beers aren't clean cause they are, I mean, there's a lot of great ales out there. Um, and, and the ester profile and these other things are associated with what we're experiencing, but to have these, like the way they finish and like the dryness of them and the cleanliness of the back end, And, and it's just so exciting to see some of that stuff happening. So of course we went and we went into the kitchen hard and we, we started brewing a lot and we, we were playing around with these these beers, uh, one was called Los Padres Lager that we're still working on. Um, we're having a lot of fun with these one-off Pilsners, but we were doing crazy stuff in my head because I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm still like wondering if I add hops in the whirlpool to lockers, you know, like we're, we're doing a lot of like these classic kind of methodology on, on a lot of these hot, on these, on these brews. And I'm looking at stuff where it's like, what if we just started what if we just started throwing hops at knockout? Like we just throw it in the fermenter and throw it here and there. And, and, uh, we're taking different lots of strata, different lots of, of citra, even playing there. We'd love El Dorado. Um, El Dorado is an incredible hop for lagers. For those of you that are brewing that, that have not played around with El Dorado, I would, I would strongly encourage you to start, start going there. Um, it's really fun when, when you take a single hop El Dorado, um, almost we're calling it like new Pilsner, Neo Pilsner, um, super light, like 4.2 to 4.5%, uh, rice lager basically. And, um, it's bone dry. I mean, it's finishing anywhere from, you know, 0.6 to 0.8. And, um, like everybody started using the word crispy, you know, this was crispy came what th- two or three years ago. And everybody's like, crispy boy, this crispy boy, that. And I was like, okay, th- let's, let's, let's find that. Let's work on the crisp. Let's work on the new, uh, kind of contemporary hop profiles and I thought Highland Park was doing such a great job that it really inspired us um, to to start stepping out and having some fun there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's funny you say that El Dorado, huh? What do you? Yeah. How, why? Why El Dorado? What is it about sensory that uh, you find lends itself to this kind of thing? So years ago, um, we we did a beer. Um, it was a pale, it was a single hot pale ale. We had a single hot pale ale series called Trail Pale for a while, where we were always experimenting and playing around with with hop varietals, and we found that El Dorado. Um, we changed up all the hop addition methods over the course of time, doing a couple of Eldorado beers. And we always thought Eldorado needed like a hand, needed a friend, needed another hop to kind of help pop it and accentuate it. And, um, we found that suddenly you remove a lot of the other flack and all the other stuff that's going on in IPA. And it just opened it up. It turned it into like this wonderful bouquet and flavor of, um, it's got kind of that like Gaia melon, that kind of like tropical melon flavor, uh, not overwhelming, certainly some citrus there. 
And uh, I think it lends really well to light lager of any kind and a little bitterness. I think if you're adding it at the right times, so I think Eldorado has some nice clean bitterness that, that really works in, in, in some of these contemporary Pilsner styles. You mentioned Strata also. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, that hop addition method for some of these kinds of, uh, you know, progressive Pilsners, progressive uh, hoppy lagers. Sure. Um, you know, are there methods that produce the kind of clean hop flavor that you're looking for versus, you know, some more cluttered flavor that may uh, sure. occur in other kinds of methods. Yeah. First thing I'll say is, is strata is we call it dumb, dumb, good. We like it a lot. Dumb, dumb, good. Yeah. Okay. Dumb, dumb, good. It's cheater hop. Huh? Yeah. It's fun. It's, it's really fun to work with. We've, we've found um, that we really enjoy it in, in several different beer styles, but um yeah. So what, what I would say is that um, we, we don't really use strata early in the boil. Um, we've, we found a, a more success, uh, back into the boil, um, certainly dry hopping, certainly, um, even in, I think, uh, I think it was Ben, uh, I, I don't, and I don't know for sure if it was Ben Edmonds, um, from Breakside that was dip hopping, um, like the technique of where you're adding it into the, uh, fermenter, uh, whether it's with water or with, um, with wort or something, and then it's going into fermentation. But we found that if you add, strata or or eldorado at basically at cast out at knockout to your to your fermentation vessel that we were getting i mean we were expecting there to be no aroma like it's all going to blow out it's all going to ferment out you're not going to get it but when we're fermenting at low temperatures like the the fermentations aren't vigorous so i mean we're not we're not seeing like crazy crazy um off gassing and um those I mean, I love reading my team's notes on, on the clipboards, you know, we have all these notes and when you see like dumb, dumb, good, and like this, this is awesome. And wow, this is incredible. I mean, that, that, that's the stuff that says, okay, maybe there's something here. So we found out strata. We really like on the back end, um, uh, late whirlpool edition, stuff like that. We, we also have fun with Eldorado, um, even early first word hopping. Um, we've done some mash hopping with, with Eldorado as well. Um, and we've also done that, that kind of dip hopping or uh, cast out hopping, knockout hopping kind of styles as well. So I think, um, Eldorado, it, never, it hadn't occurred to me before just now that that kind of colder, slower fermentation may reduce off gassing, which also may help some of the kind of flavor and aromatic components of those hops remain in solution. But now it seems to like conceptually make sense. It's so, uh, new to it's us like cold ipa might also be you know this kind of working I, thing i yeah. talked i talked to kevin briefly about um we we made a beer one of my first beers ever at figaro mountain was called turbo and it was this like new american kolsch kind of take on american kolsch around six percent um it was mostly mosaic mosaic was super hot uh it still is obviously but uh this was in like 2013 14 and um i remember talking to him about it and he was like well i hope you had more success with coal sheets than we did. We had, we had a lot of trials and tribulations around trying to figure out the direction to go here. And I, I remember really enjoying that. But then once we went to lager and we're actually working on a new beer right now, um, that's actually playing with some cryo and doing some other stuff. Um, but that is kind of the foundation of turbo. I'm kind of using that, but now we're, we're bringing it back down to like the kind of 4.8, 4.7% range and, and really dry. And I think uh, fermenting it even colder than what we would have fermented the Kolsch. I, I think that there could be something there. And then, you know, Kevin's already done quite a lot of work with with uh, cold IPA, but maybe it's um, maybe it's just a one one step colder. I don't I don't know. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. He's it's like he's a going spinal tap. This yeah, one this yeah, one this goes one, to eleven. This one yeah. It's this one, one goes to eleven. Yeah. That's it's but it's one level colder. No. Yeah. I, and and that's not for sure. We're still that's TBD, I guess. But um, just, just being able to talk with Kevin and, and kind of see the direction he was going in there and, and his philosophy on that was, was really exciting for us. And I thought, you know, he, he's, he's taking these yeasts and he's ferment, fermenting them a little warmer. And I was like, well, what if we, what if we went even colder than we already do? And let's, let's see what happens. It, it kind of renders this like really clean, more delicate. I'm not going to say it's nowhere near the Highland Park stuff. The Highland Park stuff is like blow your face off. Like the hop character is open to a can and you look 20 feet away from you and you see where it's being open. Sure. Sure. Where this is more a little nuanced, a little delicate. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's that way, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, our IPA issue is uh, on its way out. In fact, by the time that this episode airs, it'll actually be out there in the world <clears throat> and everybody will know that, uh, our 
top scoring IPA for this year was uh, It Just Works, a cold IPA from Green Cheek. Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. And and Evan is one of those guys too. I mean, I, to be honest, I've I've been a big fan of what Evan's been doing uh, for a long time. He uh, he's honestly he's helped me out with a with a lot of questions that I've had as as a young brewer moving to California, and um, he's he's got something figured out there. I gotta say, he's he's definitely a genius. Yeah, um, yeah. you know, and the the beers back it up. But sure yeah, do. it's it's kind of interesting to to see it from that perspective. So um, talk to me about uh, fresh hop. Lagers. This is uh, kind of some interesting, weird territory. The idea of pushing fresh hops into lagers um, doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, but you guys have been uh, kind of working on that and are, are going to continue to push that this uh, coming season. Absolutely. Yeah. So fresh hop lager beer is just, it's, it's a lot of fun. I think, um, you know, I look at, at the great fresh hop beer brewers, you know, the, the bale breakers, the, the pint house pizzas, the, um, uh, who were we just talking? Uh, we were uh, Cloudburst, you know, I mean, they're just Fremont. I did a whole free, episode oh my of the God. podcast Fremont. with Fremont. With Fremont Matt. alone. Um, Fremont, the volume of, of, uh, wet hops that, and, and fresh hops that they're doing is, is enough for the entire country probably <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're, uh, they're doing wonders for sure. And, um, just the Koichi series alone is, is yeah. just so rad and, and incredible what they're doing, but an um, entire episode of the podcast talking about that and the investment, uh, that I did with Matt Lincoln a little, a little while back. And so, yeah, it is incredibly cool what they're doing in that realm. It's unbelievable. I mean, just the, the, the turnaround time alone. I mean, there, so even being up there, you got to think about how many truckloads are coming and how cold those are stored and how, how that works there. I, I assume their brew house is at least, you know, 80 to a hundred barrels, something like that. You should just listen to that episode. I'm going to tonight. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, w- with that being said, like, it's an investment even in the field itself, you know, to oh, make yeah. sure that, um, you know, I, I mean the, the logistics to pull it off, uh, organizing trucks, picking everything else in order to accomplish that at that kind of volume, it's truly spectacular. It's thousands and thousands of pounds. Um, and I mean, I can't, I, I can't wait to listen to that episode, but it's gotta be a lot if of I trucks. Recall correctly, it was like 70,000 pounds. I was going to say something. it's got, I was thinking almost a hundred thousand. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. That's just madness. Uh, in, in the coolest possible way. I've been to that fresh hop festival in Yakima like several times and, and it's, it's an eye opening experience. People really have an appreciation for fresh hop beers and we're starting to kind of translate that down here. Um, we do a, we do a series that we call grass mountain. We have a, a beautiful mountain range right here. One of the main faces of it is grass mountain and, uh, it's got wildflowers on it every year and it's, it's an easy inspiration for us. It's, it's really going, about uh, maybe three or four months before uh, fresh hop season. So I was like, well, let's, let's commemorate this beautiful mountain face here. And uh, we've done, you know, everything you can imagine. We've done fresh hop porters, fresh hop pale ales, fresh hop IPAs, fresh hop double IPAs, covered the whole spectrum. And then we look at, well, why aren't we doing a fresh hop lager like this? We should be doing that. So one year we decided that we were going to run fresh hop lager and the fresh hop lager turned out to be a success, um, disappeared so fast. Even though it was called Fresh Hop Lager, most people just had no idea. So we've been kind of retooling those ideas this year. We've got a couple ideas with how we're going to um, kind of expand and, and learn more about Fresh Hop Lager. And uh, even earlier, uh, as earlier this week, I, I discovered that they were doing, YCH anyway, uh, is doing uh, frozen Fresh Hops. So frozen Fresh Hops now are... It's like IQF uh, uh, well, hops. It's, it's pretty amazing. It's unbelievable. So, I mean, suddenly we have uh, the availability potentially to do year-round fresh hops. And if that's if that's a possibility, I mean, we're going to see a lot of really interesting takes and approaches uh, to, to fresh hop beer. But one thing I really like about fresh hop lager is that even like West Coast IPA, you know, where at, w- at one time, you know, there was, there was crystal malt and there was stuff in it. Now, now it's literally, okay, you need just this base malt and you need something just to give it a little head basically is, is what I, what I hear from most people. And some people are still even adding like dextrose or something just to dry it out a bit further where you have like new American Pilsner or even like kind of more contemporary stuff. It's you're looking at nothing. I mean, like you can just start with just pills or just one base malt and that's it. And now you have the perfect canvas in my opinion to start to experience fresh hops. I mean, fresh hops yeah, are so yeah. delicate. They have this grassiness and you're really missing a lot of the other stuff. If 
Um, you're, you're using a ton of other ingredients with it. Um, if really what you're going for is hundred percent fresh up, but I will say that, um, we've also made some great fresh hop IPAs and stuff that we use pellets too. I mean, where you're getting like this wonderful balance of bitterness, um, cause that's, it's a little harder to do in the fresh hop realm, but you can take that and you can accelerate that and so, say, all right, I know this is the mouthfeel. This is the mid palate. This is like the back end. This is how I want the whole beer to be experienced. You might need a little help from pellets at times, but um, I think it's it's a great canvas. It, it really it really can showcase the the quality and, and the experience and attributes of the hops. Now we get into like weird definitional arguments about whether it's really a fresh hop beer if uh, you've also used pellets in there it, sure. somewhere or another. Yeah, and, and and when I say used pellets, it's more just small kettle additions. Just yeah, to, yeah. We we always for for the dry hopping of that, we always just a lot. We we barely even dry hop those beers. I mean, if anything, I mean it's we try to use fresh hops where we can. We were even freezing our own <laughs> a little bit from time yeah, to time yeah. Um, just to try all that out. It, it didn't always work. Um, but now to see that there's a potential avenue forward, uh, that's pretty exciting. Sure, sure. Are there any other uh, lager experiments that you're uh, excited about or focused on? Uh, we're working on warm lager. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, it's the yin and the yang. There's right, always right? a counter trend there's to gotta, trend. There's got to be one, right? Um, yeah. No, I mean, I, I was kind of joking around with the idea of, of brute lager because, you know, brute IPA came along and somewhere there's, there's some macro brewer guy that, that or girl that's just like rolling their eyes and whatever, but crispy. Right, Cause cr- it already exists. It does. Because that's right. light beer in general. Yeah, Light it's, beer in it general. All, it's just not going to have a whole lot of residual sugar, but at the same time, and like, that's where glucoamylase, you know, kind of got its foothold. I mean, it really was that's right. an innovation in order to promote the light lager entire, you know, like that was it's, it. It's right. It's I'm going to quote Ron Burgundy. It's science. It's, it's this whole elaborate spell, right. Of how do we figure out how to have uh, low carb, low this, low that, all the things that are low, um, but high flavor. So we're kind of, we, we made a light lager, um, Fig Mountain Light, um, back in 2017. And, um, I remember in development meetings, just getting laughed out of the room, like, what the hell are you thinking? Why are, why are we going to make a light lager? It's, it's dumb. It turned out to be our third most, uh, sold draft, um, for a very long time until we introduced Aguasanta, the beer we were drinking earlier. And, um, it turned out that people did want a light beer. They wanted something that they could drink. It's really nice on the beach here. It's really, really easy to get at. And now I see a lot of great breweries that are making incredible light lagers. But the step beyond that in my head is, is this kind of contemporary Pilsner? Like, can we go to zero Plato? Can we uh, still have some bitterness? Can we uh, showcase aroma? Can we do all these things through a light lager that I'm wondering if it's called brute lager or I'm wondering if it's just called a uh, contemporary American Pilsner or a new lager. I, I don't know the direction because, uh, the ones that I'm tasting are also different from each other. So is it, uh, going to warrant further classification or is it just, you know, it's a beer and it tastes good. Why don't you revolution revolutionize the light lager game <laughs> with American hops and all of that insanity that comes with it? No, I love that idea. That's it's ridiculous, but also really fun. Yeah. I think it, there, there, there might be room for it. Okay. Well, you keep pushing that element. Um, we've got a few more minutes left before uh, we have to wrap up. Talk to me about uh, you know some of the other uh, beers that you are making now, and some of the other elements of innovation, uh, maybe even the non logger realm that yeah, sure. uh, you're excited about. And when I say innovation, I mean you know finding ways to make classic styles and do them in, in fun ways. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I mean, right now I'm trying to think of of. A uh, ton of things. We we are doing a quite a bit of lager stuff right now at this time, but um, you know I th- what a time to be alive. I mean, I love that we're talking to craft brewers all over the place about how they brew lagers. You it's know. it's 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 my passion, um, lager beer is specifically, but it doesn't mean that I'm not very passionate about the other beers that we're doing. We do have a, a small barrel program. I did mention James Parrish earlier, and we do an anniversary beer every year, and and we like to have a lot of fun with that. And um, something that that we like to do is. Uh, it's a new beer every year. There is no like blending behind it. There's no, it's every year. It's completely different. We like to source all kinds of different barrels. Um, so this year we're, uh, we're working on a, it's going to be about, 
I mean, I know there's a lot of uh, pastry stout out there and, and a lot of it is, is very, very high alcohol, um, but it has tons of residual sugar. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to create a beer that has high alcohol, but doesn't have a ton of residual sugar. It's, it's got enough where it doesn't feel like, oh, wow, this is dry and this is astringent and this is hurting, hurting my mouth, sure, sure. you know? So um, what we did is, again, it's, I hate to say it, it's a lager, <laughs> but um, I, I had to jump back in on fair enough, fair just, enough. just to say Can't it. stop, won't stop. That's right. You know, and um, so what we did is we made, we basically made a, uh, it's a very, very big Baltic Porter and the Baltic Porter itself, uh, it's going to, it will be uh, at the end of it all. It's probably going to be around 15.6%. Well, um, damn. We, we like to go hard in the paint as they say with, with our anniversary beers. But um, so the goal here, we did it uh, 50, 50. Uh, there's a great distillery pin hook. I'm not sure if you've heard of them mm-hmm. before, Sure. Um, but we were using one of their um, higher end rival ends. Um, so we've, we've got those barrels and then we also have, so it's a barrel aged Baltic all barrel aged. Okay. Um, and then, you know, the pastry stout exists now, right? So we, we've got to get involved on, on our own feet. Um, so uh, we are going to be adding vanilla and coconut as well. Pastry uh, uh, lagers, pastry oh, lagers. Damn. Can you believe it? Yeah, I never thought I'd be here, but um, you, you gotta you gotta taste it. It's, it'll be out uh, in late November, so I'll send you a bottle. It sounds delicious. Uh, I'm I'm looking forward to it. We tasted it the other day. I'm stoked. We did actually get some uh, flavored lagers with you know all sorts of things added to them um, when we did our <laughs> lager issue, and it was weird. You know, it, I, I mean, I I get it. I don't understand why someone would go to some of the trouble that they do in order to produce a lager beer only to to add, do all that add flavors to your light lager um you know no no uh judgment on those that are doing yeah. it. it just might not be my jam no we um we figured i mean it's it's uh but the, with baltic porter i mean i can see that it's already so robust it's so yeah. big and i think just the barrel character alone it's almost like okay yeah this is great um that like people would have gone absolutely apeshit for this beer back in 2012 you know like it's where it's like you don't have to add a ton of stuff to it or anything, but the way that we're getting coconut off the barrel and stuff already, I think just to kind of embellish that and just leaning into it. it, Sure. Yeah. With a little bit more flavor. It's, I think it's going to be fun. And, and beyond that, um, we're starting to play around even with throwing Danish red in some barrels, almost like a, um, like a Vienna common or something like, you know, I don't know. We're, uh, we're kind of experimenting and having some fun with, with, uh, with lager beer and, and, and pushing it to the limit. Yeah, you know, how do those stand up through that that kind of barrel process and treatment? Well, I look at, um, you know, I look at Firestone Walker and, and what they've been able to do over the years with DBA and just just how awesome that is and, and the union system and um, it's it's a different philosophy. It's it's not spending as much time in there, so I think we're we're kind of looking at that as like a you know it doesn't need to be in there for the extended maturation times. It doesn't need to be in there for for eight to twelve to even beyond. You know, you can really get some nice character that still kind of finds balance with the lager itself, um, you know, in under five months. So, um, it's, and there's some out there that would say, no, age it two years, just let it, let it sit, let it sit there. Um, so we're, we're starting to play around with that a bit and we're experimenting further and further, but, um, yeah, there, there might be something there in the long run. I mean, even New Holland with dragon's milk, it's yeah. a stout is, uh, I think about a three month aging process yeah, on that. That's right. It's, uh, you know, it kind of just depends on what the goals are there. And, 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 uh, and we do a lot of barrel maturation at, uh, cold temps. So, I mean, we're, we're literally lagering in barrels right now. Um, I know a lot of breweries that are starting to do, um, whether it's, you know, um, uh, barrel conditioned Pilsners, barrel conditioned lagers of all kinds, even, uh, Brett lagers that are being conditioned. I mean, there's a lot of that sure, going on sure. right now and, and I've tasted no, some great Allagash's ones. Brett Pilsner a couple of years oh, yeah. ago, JBF, uh, back when they had JBF live was yeah. just a revelation. Just, just absolutely brilliant. So today. cool. And, uh, of course the threes guys out of oh, uh, yeah. Brooklyn with their Unreal. fruit or fruit or lagers, um, got to taste some of those, um, that's yeah, my sister-in-law. Matthew. She's in Dumbo. So I, one day I got to go over to threes by myself and, and, uh, let's just say I was getting yelled at cause I was late <laughs> coming back. But, uh, yeah, they're, they're doing some cool stuff with, uh, some of those barrel age loggers as well. And I, I think there's, there's, uh, there's a lot more that kind of filter out, uh, you know, and it's, uh, you're right. They're, they're fun beers yeah. and it's, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if done well, then the kind of wood element adds something very subtle and, and just, uh, you know, a nice kind of roundness. Yeah. I think, I think you nailed it. It, It's, it's offering something different, but what we're looking for in most of those lager styles anyways, is some kind of, uh, yeah, well-rounded approach. And, and I think that it's, it's almost, uh, 
just for somebody to say, oh yeah, we're looking for a uh, balanced, well-rounded, you know, beer. It's like, yeah, well, okay. Yeah. We, we figured that part out, but, but what gets you there? Is it, is it barrel aging? Is it, is it something like that? And I think uh, history will tell you, yeah, they were doing a lot of that and, and why can't we do it now? Yeah. You know, although I do want, I always try to define barrel aged lagers as a modern phenomenon because, mm-hmm. you know, in the history of lagers, mm-hmm. yes, they may have been Asian wood, but almost always pitch lined, certainly pitched, trying pitched, right. Trying to eliminate the wood impact. The wood characteristics. Right. And so, you know, this, this wood mm-hmm. element of lager is definitely a modern invention. And I think that that's okay. Yeah. I think that contemporary brewers should embrace that and say, Hey, you know, this we can apply this historical approach to brewing and put our our spin on it because these are flavors that drinkers right now are interested in and i mean let's be perfectly honest about it as a commercial brewer if you can convince that consumer that really loves barrel aged you know dessert stouts to drink. if you can convince them to drink a lager then my god more power to you yeah, and you should and that yeah. and, and that is the hardest thing is the convincing right it's it's that part of well i know you're over here and you're enjoying that you're in this lane but you ever take a break from that and you ever you ever take a walk on the wild side and right. and, and try something that you're not familiar with i think i look back to a beer like um uh, Kentucky bourbon ale, uh, all text, like, sure. Th- like that, that beer rules. And, and I think about, I remember looking at that as a young brewer and saying, wait, this beer is only, I, I mean, somebody's going to kill me in the comments, but I think it was only 6.8 or something at the time. And, yeah, yeah. and it's lower ABV and it still holds up. I think, uh, they figured out how to condition it the way they liked. And, um, you get the, get the bourbon characteristics you're looking for, but you don't get all the smack, you know? And, and, sure, and that's sure. nice. That's nice. What's the, uh, what's the big picture? Well, well figure where's Figaro Mountain going and uh, what's the what's the long term goal? Yeah, so we're we're uh, we're continuing to grow. Um, I think, uh, like I said before, we're, we're family owned and um, we we have taken on some small contracts. So I don't see um, taking on more contract brewing um, as we continue to grow our own personal brand. I think we're, we're continuing to grow this campus out. Uh, we were in the middle of the largest expansion we've ever seen right at the beginning of the of the covid pandemic. So we're kind of reeling and, and uh, we're running mean and lean uh, right now. But yeah, I think we're, we're, uh, we're on the right path. We're, um, we're excited to keep carrying on and, and uh, exploring the world of great beer. Fantastic. Well, it's been really fun. I think we've packed a whole lot of conversation <laughs> into this tight <laughs> hour. It's uh, it's kind what of happens a- that you, we've drank how many 16 beers each. I think at the fantastic, point. fantastic <laughs> G and D chillers will hit 28 degrees without breaking a sweat. Pathfinder N pure seltzer nutrient ensures reliable and complete fermentation of a seltzer base craft concentrate blends from old orchard are packed with real fruit. First brumation puts you in control to design a brewery that fits your needs and make your system 100% food safe with Clarion Lubricants. Of course, if you care about what we do and love the content that we bring to you every week, then uh, yeah, subscribe to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Um, all the cool kids are doing it, I'm just saying. <laughs> and if you're a pro brewer out there, uh, try our All Access Pro subscriptions. We've actually been out here in California filming some classes for that All Access subscription uh, video class program. And uh, all I can say is that if you're not already a subscriber to that, you definitely will be wanting to subscribe after you see some of the uh, classes that we've been filming this week. Um, Kevin, if people want to learn more about you, uh, about Figaro Mountain, where do they find you all? Absolutely. Yeah, you can find us uh, at F-I-G-M-T-N-B-R-E-W. Uh, that's at all the channels you would expect. Uh, F-I-G-M-T-N-B-R-E-W.com. Uh, I am at wet.work. That is my personal handle. If you ever want to DM me, ask any questions about our process or our products, happy to respond. Um, yeah, that's. Uh, you can also find us right here in Buellton, California. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, let's finish off some loggers before I have to uh, hit the road and uh, move on to my next day of this busy, busy trip. But I appreciate you making some time and uh, talking to me on the podcast. Cheers. Oh, the pleasure's all mine. Thanks so much for coming by, Jamie. Yeah, and uh, we'll see you soon. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.